So we are now recording. And uh, I'm going to share the screen with you. Uh, to show you some things on the canvas platform. Linda, have you been able to sign into the canvas platform yet? Oh, yes, I have. Okay, so you're familiar with the platform itself. Yes, I am. Okay, so since this is your first meeting, uh, Linda and I've Vanny and, and Ada are, are familiar with this this information from previous sessions in the last couple of weeks. On the Canvas platform, under the announcements tab, if you go to any one of these lectures, and you can see here, this is January. This is the November 9th, twenty twenty two. It's the first and second lectures. Those are going to be very similar to the first and second lectures that were done on Monday a week ago and on Monday two days ago by me. But these were with the previous group. So you can go back to these, these previous lectures and you can review these. And if you click on that title, you get uh, you get a link to the, the Teasel Canada YouTube channel. And if you, if you click on the YouTube channel, it'll actually take you out to the, uh, the YouTube Teasel Canada channel. And then here are, my, here are the various recordings on different topics. And you can see there I am doing the, uh, the various lectures in for different groups in, in in uh, previous sessions. So here's, this is one done by Anna Patricia on uh, the methodologies. And this is, this is the very first one in the introduction to Teasel and Canvas. That's my introductory webinar that I do all the time. So anyway, uh, go out to the Teasel Canada, the channel, and you can review the, uh, the lectures, the previous lectures, okay? Oh. So just to to give you that uh, that information. Hello, Zara. Hi, how are you? Sorry, I'm late. Hi, Ida. Hi. Hi. How are you? We're good, thanks. How are you doing? I'm doing fine, thank you. Very good. So I was just reviewing the uh, the announcements tab on Canvas, which is where you can get the link to the Teasel oh. Canada YouTube channel to watch previous lectures, recordings of previous lectures. And and you can also oh. watch these, these recordings that we're doing currently, these will be posted shortly on the, the YouTube channel as well. And you can use these uh, to help you prepare for your exams and do review work as well. You can listen to these recordings again at your leisure. So today we're going to uh, proceed with more information about different methodologies and approaches. And so on the Canvas platform, we're going to... Uh... Can I have a question, Daniel, before we just uh, go forward? Yes, go ahead with your question, Zara. Um, recent, uh, actually, I was at the syllabus last time, and which uh, uh, you were supposed to just teach on Monday. I thought I had I had missed that uh, session, but uh, it seems that it, we're not. I mean, working based on the syllabus, aren't we? Well, normally I do the Monday class. Uh huh. But Anna Patricia China would normally do the Wednesday class. Yes. And El yeah, Ham, I've said Elham Masagi does Saturdays. Yeah. But Anna Patricia is not available today, so that's why I'm doing today's class. Oh, okay. So did you? Uh, were, were you um, just uh, teaching us something on, on Monday too? Yeah, on Monday, a lot. Oh, on I Monday, missed this. So I'm sorry. On Monday we did uh, we did some methodology. Okay, you did it. We did some work on oh, okay. methodologies. I'm going to do a quick review of what we did on Monday, and then I'm going to continue on with more oh, new okay. material today. So we have the uh, the grammar translation method, 
which is the method that was used for thousands of years uh, by most countries, most nations, the grammar translation in the learning of a new language uh, would focus on just the grammatical structure of the new language and uh, translating words and phrases. And so it was basically to, to learn a new language for the purposes of, of scholarly reading and writing. But there was very little work ever done with speaking and listening. So it was grammar translation as a methodology was never really a very good uh, communication method of learning a new language. And then in the early 20th century, uh, the direct method came along. And with the direct method, which we also refer to sometimes as the Berlitz method, because Charles Berlitz, Dr. Charles Berlitz, he wanted to name a method after himself, and he was a strong believer in the direct method. So he called Berlitz method, but the Berlitz method and the direct method are basically the same thing. Mm -hmm. And the direct method of learning a new language is very much naturalistic and very similar to the way that children learn their first language. And it was at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century that the direct method became a widely known practice. And the basic premise was that second language learning should be more like mother tongue learning lots of by learning lots of oral interaction, spontaneous use of the language, no translation between first and second languages, and little or no analysis of grammatical rules. So just as when young children are learning the, the mother first language, their mother tongue, they learn it by listening to the adults around them. They mimic the adults, they copy what they hear. And so the direct method is very naturalistic in that sense as well. The students hear the words being said by the, the, the teacher, the teacher speaking new words, and the student just copies those words and copies the sounds. So that was the direct method, and, and here's the mention of the, the Berlitz method. Uh, he wasn't happy enough to, to just call it the direct method. He, he took the, the elements of the direct method and called it the Berlitz method to make it his own name. A little bit of narcissism, I think, coming through there, but that's okay. So then by the end of the first quarter of the 20th century, the use of the direct method had declined both in Europe and in the United States, most language curricula return to grammar translation method or to a reading approach that emphasized reading skills in foreign languages. However, interestingly enough, by the middle of the 20th century, the direct method was revived and redirected into what was probably the most visible of all language teaching revolutions in the modern era, the audiolingual method. Now, just before we go to the audiolingual method on the next page, can anybody tell me what was the other name of the audiolingual method? Army language. I'm sorry, what was that? That was army language. I can't catch the words that you're saying, Zara. Um, the army, army. Army, like uh, army oh, the, arm, the army, just, army, method. Like the army, the army, army, method. Method. army, method. Yeah. army, method. Yeah, yeah, army, method. Yeah. that's correct. You're absolutely correct. Yes, sorry, I just couldn't quite understand the word. What did I say? What did I say? I said army language. I'm sorry, army method. I'm oh, sorry, army, army method. method. That's okay. <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> Communication is such a wonderful thing, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's all right, but the army method, you're absolutely correct. So we're not going to spend time doing these quizzes or any, any of these, these things. We're not going to look at the worksheet. You can look at those worksheets yourselves. I want to get right on to the, uh, the methodologies. So we have the audiolingual method. And in the Canvas platform, these videos, these are very, very useful videos to demonstrate to you 
how the different methodologies and approaches work. So I strongly encourage you to watch these videos. We're not going to take the time right now to watch all of these videos. Uh, there are probably two or three we will have a look at, but you should watch these on your own time. I'm more interested in the going over the details of these methodologies with you. In the first half of the 20th century, the direct method did not take hold in the United States the way it did in Europe. While one could easily find native speaking teachers of modern foreign languages in Europe, such was not the case in the United States. Also, European high school and university students did not have to travel far to put another language's oral skills into actual practice. Moreover, U.S. educational institutions had become convinced that a reading approach to foreign languages was more useful than an oral approach, given the perceived linguistic isolation of the United States at the time. So the thinking in the United States was that, why do we need to learn a foreign language? Because we're just living in the United States and all of the, the country, all of the United speak, all of the United States speaks one one English language, you know, the American version of the English language. Now, to be sure, there were pockets of immigrants, Irish and Italian and Dutch immigrants, German immigrants. There were small pockets of populations uh, in, in larger cities, especially. There'd be small areas where a different language would be a native spoken language, but for the most part, English was the dominant language throughout the United States. So the thinking was, why do we need to learn second languages? Because we all just speak English anyway. And the, the interesting thing is that even though it's all English, American English that's spoken throughout the United States, there is a dialect, a regional dialect change from one area of the American Americas to another area. So the United States being such a large country, and I have traveled extensively over the years into different parts of the United States. And, and I've been down into Virginia and Tennessee, into the mountain areas of, of Tennessee. And uh, whenever we, we took driving trips, uh, we would stay off the main highways because it's more interesting to go on the back roads anyway. We would go through small communities, but we went into uh, one. We found found one community on our highway down in the mountains in Tennessee on one of our trips, and the 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 city was in the process of uh, blowing out the sides of the mountain, exploding the sides of the mountain, because this town uh, it ran along the side of a mountain. And it was just a, a road along the side, right literally on the side of the mountain. And then there was about 150 feet back from the mountain face that they had blown this out. And the buildings were all built in that empty space that they had created. And they were actually exploding, you know, blowing rock out of the mountain up ahead part of the on part of the highway. So it was closed for a while. So we decided to stop and have lunch at a restaurant. We went into this restaurant. <clears throat> now we speak English, and English is our native language, and English was the native language of the people in this town. But this is out in the mountains, way out in the, the rural areas of Tennessee, up in the mountains, and the, the waitress speaking English, we could not understand what she was saying, and she could not understand what we were saying, and we were all speaking English. <laughs> Yeah, we had to order our lunch by pointing to the pictures on the menu. You know, they had pictures of different plates of food on the menu. We pointed at this plate and that plate. And that's how we ordered our food because we couldn't understand each other. So even with even within a given language, and I'm sure with your own native languages, uh, you find the same types of things. So. Uh, Ada, Farsi is your native language, but you can go to different areas of Iran, different cities and different regions of Iran, and the Farsi probably has a regional uh, uh, regional tonality and 
regional interpretations to it. Yeah, yeah, different accents. And even, you know, we have different languages in Iran. Yes, exactly. But, yeah, even the parts that they speak or see, the accents are totally different. Sometimes, yeah, it is hard to understand. That's yeah. exactly right. So, so even, even with one language, it can be a difficult experience. But nonetheless, in the, the early part of the 20th century uh, in the United States, they really didn't see the need to learn a foreign language because they said, oh, we all speak English. Well, yes, it's true, but you have to be able to understand the English that's being spoken as well. So, so that was in the, the early part of the 1900s. But then in, in the 1930s and 1940s, schools returned to the grammar translation method. Now, World War II broke out uh, in uh, the early 1940s. And when it broke out and suddenly the United States was thrust into this worldwide conflict, heightening the need for Americans to become orally proficient in the languages of both their allies and their enemies. Because what was happening now was the American soldiers were being sent overseas. They were being sent into Europe and other countries, uh, other other areas to uh, to act uh, as interpreters, or in, in some cases, they were sent into enemy countries to act as spies. And if they were acting as a spy, then they should be able to, they better be able to speak that language in the country where they're, they're doing their spy work. They'd better be able to speak that language as if they're a natural speaker of that language, as if they were born to it. Because if, if they don't speak it really, really perfectly well, naturally, it'll be obvious. And the fact that they're a spy will be figured out and they will probably be executed. So, so the the need and the the requirement to learn second languages and learn to be able to speak them perfectly, the need became even greater. And all of a sudden, the United States developed this army method or the audiolingual method. They developed this method of teaching second languages. So whether the the army personnel, whether the the soldiers were learning. Uh, I mean, English would have been their native language, but whether they were learning French or Dutch or German or Italian, whatever language they were learning, the audiolingual method, the ALM method, became the, the process by which they, they learned this new language. Very, and it's a, a method that's very similar to the Rosetta Stone method. <clears throat> you may be familiar with the Rosetta Stone method. Yeah. Do you know about the Rosetta Stone method? Actually, the Rosetta Stone method is, um, is a little bit better than uh, a duolingo method because um, um, it, it, it's kind of interactive. So you can interact with the, with the software that you're playing with and you can just produce something and can get some feedback. But in the um, this uh, other method and a duolingo method, you're just able to just uh, memorize I mean, then um, produce something that you have memorized without understanding the meaning. And the problem with this method was that the, the, the uh, learners were not able to uh, communicate and to produce their message that they have in their mind. So because of that, it was it just, it just failed at some point. So because they, they couldn't communicate with other people based on what they wanted to just produce by, by themselves. But, uh, you know, um, just the basic memorization and language doesn't work for those people. So, Rosa, so I, I, I meant to say that Rosa so is a little bit much, a little more better than the audio <laughs> method because they are a little bit interactive, more interactive that the, the people can communicate. So I meant to say that. The, the audio lingual method, the army method was, was interactive in, in that it was based on improving communication. And the students would copy. Yeah, but as I've read, yeah, just copy. They, they had to just memorize. 
memories like they were at some point when they were when they, they just want to come to just to do something they were not able as far as i have read because i have read a lot of times about this i mean this method and i, I know that this method has problem has some problems um you know and communicating and as they are you know because language is a dynamic thing and they were not able to produce different kind of messages um, unless that that in, that memorize those um you know sentences or uh, words or um structures i meant to say that right that's right and and a big part of the audio lingual method was that it was grounded in linguistic and psychological theory yes the structural linguists of the 1940s and 1950s were engaged in what they claimed was a scientific descriptive analysis of various languages. Teaching methodologies mm -hmm. saw a direct application of such analysis to teaching linguistic patterns. At the same mm -hmm. time, behavioristic psychologists advocated conditioning and habit formation models of learning exactly. that were perfectly matched with oral drills and pattern practices of audiolingual methodology. Then there's this list of characteristics of the audiolingual method as summarized by Praetor and Celsimersia in their analysis of ALM. New material is presented in dialogue form. There is dependence on mimicry, memorization of set phrases, and overlearning of certain phrases to communicate. Structures are sequenced through contrastive analysis and taught one at a time. Structural patterns are taught using repetitive drills. There's little or no grammatical explanation. Grammar is taught by inductive analogy rather than by reasonable explanation. In other words, they would learn the grammar of how sentence structure is formed. They would learn the grammar inductively just by saying it and hearing it and repeating it. But they wouldn't actually do grammar skills. They wouldn't do, they would not do drills and and skill pages. The vocabulary is strictly limited and learned in context. There's much use of tapes, language labs, and visual aids. Considerable importance is attached to pronunciation. The limited use of the mother tongue by the teacher was permitted. The successful responses are immediately reinforced. And there is a great effort to get students to produce error-free utterances. There is a tendency to manipulate language and disregard content. For some reason, the ALM enjoyed many years of popularity and even to this day, adaptations of the ALM are found in contemporary methodologies. The ALM was firmly rooted in respectable theoretical perspectives at the time. Materials were carefully prepared, tested out, and disseminated to educational institutions. Students could experience success more overtly as they practiced their dialogues in the off hour. However, its popularity was not to last forever. We discovered that language was not acquired through a process of habit formation over learning. Errors should not be avoided at all costs. And the structural linguistics did not tell us everything about the language that we needed to know. While the ALM was a valiant attempt to reap the fruits of language teaching methodologies that had preceded it, in the end, it still fell short, as all methods do. But we learned something from the very failure of the ALM to do everything it had promised, and we moved forward. In the 1970s, Notional functional syllabus was developed by the Council of Europe, and was be and they began to use it in the in the United Kingdom in the 1970s. The distinguishing characteristics of the NFS were its attention to function as the organizing element of English language curriculum, and its contrast with the structural syllabus in which sequence grammatical structures served as the organizers, reacting to methods that attended too vigorously to grammatical form, the NFS 
sought to focus sharply and in some of its interpretations exclusively on the practical purposes to which we put language. As such, it was not a method at all. It was close to what we have already described as an approach, but it was more specifically focused on curricular structure than an appropriate approach would be. Notions, according to Van Eck and Alexander, are both general and precise. General notions are abstract concepts such as existence, space, time, quantity, and quality. Whoops. Well, that really jumped. Sorry about that. Let me get back to it here. These, these are the domains in which we use language to express thought and feeling. Within the general notion of space and time, for example, are the concepts of location, motion, dimension, speed, the length of time, frequency, etc. Specific notions correspond more closely to what we've become accustomed to calling contexts or situations. So personal identification, for example, is a specific notion under which name, address, and phone number and other personal information are subsumed. Other specific notions include travel, health and welfare, education, shopping, services, and free time. The functional part of notional functional syllabus corresponds to, to language functions. Curricula are organized around such functions as identifying, reporting, denying, accepting, declining, asking permission, apologizing, etc. Van Eck and Alexander in 1980 list some 70 different language functions. Now, you're not required to know all 70 of those, but here's a here's an overview of some some of the main categories that were used to organize different functional topics. So introductions, greetings, goodbyes would be would be lumped together. Invitations, apologies, condolences, those would be grouped together. Gratitude, compliments, congratulations, those are, are part of another set of functions. And so these different categories that the, the functions that these 70 odd functions would fall into. A typical unit in this textbook included a presentation of dialogues, conversation practice with a classmate, situations in which the student figures out what show, role plays and chart work. It included multiple choice exercises on functional considerations, one-sided dialogues where the student fills in responses, nonverbal considerations, discussion activities and community practices for extra class practice. In this historical sketch of methodology, it is essential to recognize that the NFS did not necessarily develop communicative competence in learners, but it set the stage for bigger and better things. By attending to the functional purposes of language and providing contextual notional settings for the realization of those purposes, it provided a link between a dynasty of methods that were now perishing and a new era of language teaching called Communitive Language Teaching, CLT. So all of these different methodologies and approaches that we've looked at up to this point in time, the grammar translation method, uh, the direct method, the ALM, uh, the notional functional syllabus, all of these, all of these methodologies were not enough in their in themselves, by themselves, they were not enough to be a complete language learning or language teaching experience. In the 19, late 1980s, 1990s, the communicative language teaching uh, methodology evolved. And this is a very good video as well. Watch this video for sure when you have a moment. And CLT is currently the recognized approach and the accepted norm in the field of language learning. 
beyond grammatical and discourse elements in communication, CLT is probing the nature of social, culture, and pra pragmatic features of the language. So you see, CLT is looking at all aspects of, of the learner. It's a, it's a whole language approach. They're looking at the whole person, the whole student. So they're looking at not just the, the, the grammatical aspects of language learning and memorizing words and memorizing phrases. They're looking at the social aspects of the, the learner. Uh, they're looking at at all of these other aspects, cultural aspects of, of the learner's environment. So taking into, into consideration all these features that come together in the entire learning experience. And, and this is true not only of, of language learning, but of any subject. Whether the subject is history or sociology or mathematics or science or language learning, whatever the subject is, all of these factors come into play in the student learning. So we need to, to look at our students and we need to consider all of, all of these aspects, the social, the cultural, the prag pragmatic aspects of, of the student's environment and the student learning process in order to help them learn whatever the subject is. Now, right here, right now, we're talking about language learning, but this applies to whatever the subject might be. Because you need to teach the student as a whole person, not just teach one, one subject as a tiny element. You need to teach the student as a, as a whole person, as an entity. So teachers using CLT are trying to get their learners to develop linguistic fluency, not just the accuracy that has so consumed their historical journey. They're equipping their students with tools for generating unrehearsed language performance out there, meaning outside of the classroom, uh, when they leave the womb of the classroom. And, and this is, I believe, what uh, Zara was referring to a few moments ago when she mentioned that the ALM method was not, not allowing the students to learn how to, uh, to create new thinking processes. The ALM process was, was a mimicking, copying process, but the CLT is trying to get students to think creatively, and they're trying to get the new language to be a living language so the student thinks in the new language so they can communicate directly in the new language and not have to do a translation within their mind from their mother tongue into the new language they're learning. So they are concerned with how to facilitate lifelong language learning among their students, not just with the immediate classroom task. They're looking at learners as partners in a cooperative venture. Moreover, their classroom practices seek to draw on whatever intrinsically sparks learners to reach their fullest potential. Intrinsic motivation. What is the definition of intrinsic motivation? Can somebody tell me what is the definition of the intrinsic motivation? So intrinsic motivation is coming from the, uh, inside the learners. If they want to learn it, um, to, in another language, they need it for pleasure, for example, or for their own benefits, not for just looking for a job or yeah, you know, getting a degree at university. So it, it is coming outside. So their interest is based on their personal, um, personal uh, reason, not for outside or um, outside, um, you know, benefits of them. So that's what interest right. in, 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 in motivation. Right. That's correct, Zara. Thank you. The intrinsic motivation is for self improvement. Uh, it's because the student wants to do it. And that's the internal motivation. That's exactly right. In 1991, David Noonan offered five features to characterize CLT in his book called Language Teaching Methodology, a textbook for teachers. This is an excellent textbook. This is an excellent writing. Now, I downloaded it as a PDF from the internet. Uh, I didn't read the entire thing because it's a, it's an extremely long book, but it's a very good, 
good book to have as a reference manual. So you might want to look it up and, and download it because it is an act an excellent reference manual. I'm just wondering for a second. Let me just I'll come back to this spot in a moment. Let me just go to uh, the resources here. Just trying to remember if uh, if that David Noonan book was here on the under the resources, but I don't see it. No, I don't I don't see David Noonan's book, but this Teasel manual download this Teasel manual and use it with your. Uh, with your assignment preparations and. Uh, of course, now will I be able to find where I was. Huh. There we are. So David Noonan had these five features uh, that characterize CLT. An emphasis on learning to communicate through interaction in the target language. So communication is the key thing with CLT. And any, any function, any activity of teaching that helps to improve the communication skill of the student is appropriate to use in the CLT environment. And the introduction of authentic texts is another key important aspect of the CLT learning situation. Uh, by authentic texts, what do we mean by authentic texts? Can you give me an example? Anybody, can you give me an example of an authentic text? Uh, the material or the subject which are related to students' lives. So uh, real based um, materials, some real um, based um, or life-based uh, subjects that they can the, the student can talk about. So the teacher bring the um, the, the, the uh, subjects which are familiar with the students based on their lives, and uh, they, they they can talk about those um, you know uh, subjects in the classroom, and they can prove their uh, second language. Right. So, for instance, you could have a class of students who are are all technicians, electronic technicians, and uh, people who repair photocopy machines and electronic equipment like that. And so the, the authentic text that you could use might be uh, a, a manual that is written in English or the target language. It might be a manual about how to repair oh. the, the equipment. And that would be an authentic text that relates directly to the students and what they do in their, their real lives. So any, any text that is relevant to the students' lives outside the classroom, that is an authentic text. The provision of opportunities for learners to focus not only on language, but also on the learning process itself. So, not just looking at words on a particular topic, but discussing and, and searching out uh, methods to learn how to learn about something. So looking at, at processes for, uh, for doing research and looking things up, uh, because I, I always say as a teacher, I, I should not be required and I don't, I don't know everything. I should not be required to know everything no teacher should be, but as a teacher, I should have a pretty good idea of where I can go to find out an answer for something. So knowing where to look for answers is just as important, if not more important in this day and age than the pure knowledge itself, because there's so much knowledge out there. None of us can know everything, but knowing where to look for answers, that's that's a crucial and key skill that is important within the education environment. An enhancement of the learner's personal experience as vital contributing elements to the classroom learning. 
So draw on the students personal experiences to contribute to the classroom classroom learning. Ask the students to describe something from their experiences that uh, that link to what you're discussing and talking about. An attempt to link classroom language learning with language activation outside the classroom. So that can come with with uh, extra work assignments, extra homework assignments where you give the students a, a, an assignment that extends beyond what the classroom activity was and, and causes them to do additional thinking, maybe some additional reading or uh, extra looking up of things uh, in the evening when they're at home. So extra classwork is, is key and crucial to the ongoing success of the learning process. And then in 2012, Eli McDonough and Shaw, they noted the following implications of the communicative approach. The concept of being communicative has to do with what a language has potential to mean and its formal grammatical properties. There is a complicated relationship between language form and language function. In more traditional teaching materials, this relationship tends to be simplified, often implying a one-to-one -one correspondence so that in interrogatives, interrogatives are used for asking questions, imperatives for giving commands, conditional for making hypothetical statements, and so on. In a communicative perspective, our views on the properties of language have been explored, expanded, and enriched. Form and function operate as part of more extensive networks of, function, of factors since the real world language in use does not work in a vacuum. So in addition to talking about language function and language form, there are other dimensions of communication to consider such as topics, for example, health, transport, leisure activities, work, the context or setting, for example, personal conversation, business discussion, situations such as travel or medical settings, et cetera. The roles of people involved, for example, stranger talking to a stranger, a friend talking to a friend, a or an employer talking to an employee, a customer or a person supplying goods. The appropriacy of language use must be considered alongside accuracy. This has implications for attitudes to error since the notions of error is no longer restricted only to incorrect grammar or perhaps a choice of vocabulary if being communicative includes paying attention to context, roles, and topics, then it is logically possible to make an error at any of these levels. The communicative method is relevant to all four language skills, not only to speak English. We can group together the speaking and listening skills and the paper skills of reading and writing. In both cases, we have a giver and a receiver of a message and how the receiver understands the information in the message is an integral part of communication. The concept of communication takes us beyond the level of the sentence. A theory of communication can handle whole conversations or paragraphs even longer than text. Categories for describing language have developed in recent years based on the broad notion of discourse. This concept gives us the possibility of showing how different parts of a text or a conversation or any stretch of language are interlinked. Communication can refer both to the properties of language behavior and patterns of interaction. This how covers the activities we carry out and the tasks we perform in real life. 
one of the most comprehensive lists of CLT features came some time ago from the Finicharo and, and Brumfit in 1983 in the functional notional approach from theory to practice in a comparison of audiolingual method with what they called the communicative approach. And here's this chart again that compares ALM and CLT. So I'm not going to go through this chart in detail. I'll let you look at that chart yourself on the Canvas platform. Just while we're we're taking a little tiny bit of a break there, I had a message from Dr. Valley a few days ago where he asked me to be sure to explain uh, some points of points of study to, to you folks. And uh, and that is about uh, the Tiesel versus TSSOL. So Ada, Fatima, Zara, and Jacqueline are in TESOL, teaching English to speakers of other languages. Viany and two other people are in the, the teaching Spanish to speakers of other languages. Anyone doing the program in other languages, so Viany with the Spanish and, and Eileen with the Japanese, any people doing the other languages, have to pass all the exams in their chosen language, not in English. So the midterm, the final exam have multiple choice and written questions. The multiple choice questions, the short answer questions, so it'd be true, false, or you know, what which one of of these is the correct answer to to a question A, B, C, or D. So short answer, multiple choice questions will be done in English for everybody, but then v &E for the rest of your exam, your exam questions, the essay, the longer written questions will be written in Spanish, okay? The same is true for the final exam. All the assignments must be in the chosen language and not in English. So v &E, you will be doing your conversation activities and your four skills lesson plans, you'll be doing those as well as your essays, you'll be doing those written in Spanish. Thank you. Okay. So Dr. Valley wanted me to be sure to, to read that message that he sent me in WhatsApp. He wanted me to read that message to you just to make sure that, that you had uh, you had that clear in your minds. All right. Are there any questions about about that aspect of, of the situation, about that aspect of the course? Any questions about that while we just stop for a moment on that point? About the exam, Daniel? Sorry. Yeah, no. Go ahead. Yeah, go um, ahead. Okay, I do have a question. I haven't had the chance of uh, dedicating enough time for the modules. So right now I have pretty much my essay done. I will finalize it between today and tomorrow. So I don't have a problem with that. However, I'm considering and doing the exam for um, like the next intake or whatever that is called. I know that we have two opportunities to pass it. So I thought, okay, I can prepare today, tomorrow, and the day after, try very hard and read and get prepared and see if I can pass it. And if I don't, in the worst case scenario, can I just take my next chance for the next time that the exam is going to be over it? I don't know if that makes sense. Yes, that does make sense. I, Vianney, I, I do agree with you. I mean, you. You have been here for the lectures uh, and you've participated. And so you've been involved in the conversations about the methodologies and, and the methodologies are a big part of the midterm exam. So I would suggest that you're probably ready to write the midterm exam right now. 
you know, you're, you're all very smart people and, and you're, you're dedicated, you're dedicated students and you're, you're dedicated to doing a good job and covering the material. So if you, if you really put your mind to, to studying the methodologies and modules one and two, modules one and two are the only things that are on the midterm exam. Just modules one and two. So if you focus on going over the modules one and two material and reviewing the recordings of the lectures, even if you have to go back to previous recordings from the last session, I think you should try the, the midterm exam this coming weekend. I think you should try it. I will do it then. Thank you. I, I think you should try it and I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. You'll probably do better on it than you think you will. So I, I think you should definitely give that a try. Yes, Sarah, you have a question? Uh, I, w I wonder if uh, there will be uh, some grammatical question, like linguistic um, skills of the language as well in the midterm, or if we are just going to be tested based on the methodology and the English language method. There will very likely be some, some multiple choice questions related to grammatical structure or, or grammatical terminology, that type of thing. So it's not just the methodologies. Mm -hmm. The methodologies okay. are an important and big piece of the midterm exam. But oh. of course, there, there will probably be some other, some other aspects, such as some uh, grammatical questions as well. Yes, thank you. In the multiple choice part. Sorry, I have a question. Um, have we had an email that um, I think we on Saturday or Sunday we can you know do the midterm exam? But anyway, we have our class on Saturday, yeah. Yes. So there is no. So we have the class and we have the midterm at the same day. Well, no, it's not it's exactly, not exactly on the same day because. I think the midterm exam will you, you'll have your class on Saturday at this at this this time. Yeah. But then I believe the midterm exam will be available to you Saturday at midnight. Um, no, no, it's Sunday. And all, all day Sunday. Oh, yeah. Okay. Because the the midterm all all the both of the exams are are made available for a, about a thirty six or forty eight hour period of time. In order to cover all the time zones on the face of the earth. Exactly. So, so it's not, it's not that the exam is just available for a couple of hours. It's available to you for a couple of days. But, and then, but when we started, we have just 2 hours for that. Correct. As okay. soon as, as soon as you start the exam, the, the computer starts to count the time down. And as soon as your two hours are up, the exam closes automatically. So be sure to, you know, don't spend too much time on the short answer questions. Get through those quickly and move on to the longer essays and, and give yourself lots of time to write longer essays. When I wrote the, the final board exam, that was the problem I had. Uh, when I wrote the final board exam, it was a three hour exam. It is now a four hour exam. And, but I ran out of time with my three hours. Because I, I didn't leave myself enough time for the big essay questions. And at the very end of the exam, I was uh, my, I, I couldn't get my eyes off the clock in the corner of my computer screen. The <laughs> clock was counting down and I'm watching that count down as I'm trying to type my, my final answer. And I ended up just typing. A whole list of words that were connected to the topic. I wasn't even typing sentences. So I, and I thought to myself, I hope whoever marks this realized that these words all fit that topic, you know, <laughs> but um, anyway, and then, I, I did pass it. But anyway, be sure to leave yourself have, time. I also have a question about the exam. Is it when, when I write a paper exam? I like to take a look at the whole exam and see what the questions are and how I'm going to then allocate my time. But often on an online test, you can only go from one question to the next. So is our midterm exam structured so that we can only see one question at a time or can we review the whole exam and then determine how we're going to use our time? 
Uh, Linda, that's an excellent question. It it is yeah. not not set up to allow you to look at the entire exam. Okay. Wow. So, and we cannot we cannot go back to to, to review the answer. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't believe so. No, I don't believe so. I I couldn't when I did the the final board exam a couple of years ago. I couldn't go back. So it, it opens up. You begin at the beginning. Yeah. You work towards <laughs> the end. Now there there are amounts of time. There are, they give you they allocate a certain number of minutes along the way. For each question, and you should follow the number of minutes they they give to that question. Because the number of minutes are designed to help you make sure that you've got enough time for the questions, the bigger essay questions. Daniel, uh, I have a question. Uh, I um, I just read um, some um, some points about the um, the midterm, and I didn't I didn't find anything about the writing an essay or a, a long paragraph about something. It was just about some uh, some descriptive um, an answer to the questions, but not essay. Are you sure about the actually writing the essay? Well, I'm pretty sure you're going to have some essay style questions uh, because that that that's how you'll fill up two hours of time. Yeah, I'm mm -hmm. pretty sure there are essay questions on it, based on what other students in previous classes have told me. Uh -huh. Okay. But, I never did write the, a midterm exam because it didn't exist when I was going through the course. Daniel, do we get the results right away? It takes two or three weeks for the results to show on the Canvas platform. Oh. But it's fairly quick. And after the midterm, we have our regular classes? Yes, after the midterm. Uh, so you write the midterm on on let's say you write it on Sunday the twenty second, yeah. and on on Monday the twenty third, uh, I do a class with you about the teaching of conversation activities. So the classes continue after the midterm exam. We continue with the Monday, Wednesday, Saturday time time schedule. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. No problem. So let's just move along here with uh, with these methodologies things. And I'm not going to read all of this CLT material to you, but there are a couple of points that are, are crucial. There are numerous interpretations for CLT because it is a catch all term. So it is tempting to figure out that everyone agrees on its inter interpretation. But that's not the case. Everybody does not agree on what CLT really means. Some of those in the profession with good reason feel uncomfortable using the term. As long as you are aware of possible CLT versions, it is a term that can continue to capture current languages teaching approaches. Now take a look at any recent English as a second language textbook and try to find one that is not learner-centered, cooperative, interactive, whole language-based, or, of course, communicative. Those are all concepts closely, closely related to CLT, the latest fads in language teaching. They can also be qualified as legitimate attempts to label current concerns within the CLT framework. Here's a summary of each concept. Learner-centered teaching. Techniques that focus on or account for learners' needs, styles, and goals. Techniques that give some control to the student, group work, for example. Curricula that include the consultation and input of students and that do not presuppose objectives in advance. Techniques that would allow students creativity and innovation. Techniques that enhance a student's sense of competence and self-worth. Because language teaching is a domain that so often presupposes classrooms where students have very little language proficiency with which to negotiate with the teacher, some teachers shy away from the notion of giving learners the power associated with a learner-centered approach. <clears throat> Such restraint is not necessary because even in beginner-level classes, 
teachers can offer choices to students. All of these efforts help to give students a sense of ownership of their learning and thereby add to their intrinsic motivation. Cooperative learning. A curriculum of, or classroom that is cooperative and therefore not competitive usually involves the above learner-centered characteristics. As students work together in pairs or groups, they share information and come to each other's aid. The term cooperative also emphasizes the collaborative efforts of students and teachers to pursue goals and objectives. Now on this point, on this point of cooperative learning, in our last class, Ada and Viani and myself were talking about setting up a WhatsApp group, a WhatsApp chat group for your your group of students so that you could oh, for <laughs> sorry, yeah. So you could talk to each other and yeah. and I I always like to be part of those WhatsApp groups uh, so that I can jump into the conversation with ideas as well for you. And I can help to answer questions oftentimes. So if if do we still want to set that group up? Yeah, I think we like it. Zara, do you want to, you know? Yeah, this definitely. So yeah, would you definitely. please write your phone number on the chat box? Sure. And do you have Ada's and uh, Daniel's phone number? Yeah, you yeah, can yeah. Just put yours in the chat, and as soon as we finish this class, I can add everyone in WhatsApp. Yeah, or Linda, if you want, I can do it. Thank you. Thank you. Please and be sure to to include your country code, ladies. Whatever country you're in. Sure. Should I should I do it right now? Yeah, you can write it in the chat box. Sure. You, I just added mine as well. Very good. So, Linda, I'm you're mine. Linda, you're in Thanks, Canada. Linda. Yes, I am. So, for Lin Linda's number, Vini, put a plus a plus sign in front of the one. It's plus one, then five one nine two five seven seven three six three. You always need the plus sign before the country code. All right, very good folks. And you've got mine and you've got Ada's already. Okay, very good, thank you. So we'll watch for that. And when that message comes through, then we can each join when our invitation arrives from V&E. Um, so I, I don't have, I don't have, um, I don't have um, uh, Ada's uh, phone number. Uh, if Vianney makes the group, you know, it, it will be there. Oh, okay. Okay. Yes, yeah, so as soon as soon as you see the group, the WhatsApp group come up on your phone, uh, okay. each, of, each of our phone numbers will be there. Oh, you're, okay. You're going to make that group. Yeah. I will. Oh, you will. Yep, I will. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's perfect. Very good. Thank you. So that's that's an, an example of cooperative learning, because when we're talking with each other outside of this classroom, we're talking with each other inside the WhatsApp group. Uh, that's cooperative learning where we're learning from each other and answering questions for each other and, and having that conversation. And I, I know students in previous TESOL groups have found the WhatsApp, WhatsApp conversations to be very helpful. Uh, and very useful. So that's cooperative learning. Now, just a, a little tiny point about the midterm exam. With the midterm exam, you will be sent an email that will give you uh, a link uh, for getting into it as well as uh, a password to get into it. Uh, I don't know what the passwords are, but mm -hmm. If for some reason, when you're ready to write the midterm exam or even the final board exam a couple months from now, if you're ready to write that board or that midterm exam this weekend and you've not received the uh, the passcode, the password to get into it, send me a message in the WhatsApp group. I can always 
send a message to Dr. Valley and I can get the passcode from him so that I can put the passcode into the, the group chat. Passcode for the for the quiz, uh, Daniel, you mean? For the midterm uh, exam. For the midterm, um, we have already been given the passcode. Yeah. Yeah, they, 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 they send us. They send us. Yeah, yeah. You've yeah. got it already. Email. Yeah, we've got it. Yeah, we've got it. You've got it already. Perfect. That's that's yeah. good. Sometimes in the past, it, it was not always sent out ahead of time, and mm -hmm. so right at the last minute, the students were trying to get into the exam, and and they didn't know what the passcode was, so they would ask me, and I I'm able to get a hold of Doctor Valley through WhatsApp. But that's fine if you've already got the passcode. You're ahead of the curve, so that's that's a good yeah. thing. And so interactive learning, at the heart of current theories, communicative competence is essentially an interactive nature of communication. When you speak, for example, the extent to which your intended message is received is a factor of both your production and the listener's reception. Interactive classes will most likely be found doing a significant amount of pair group, pair work and group work, receiving valid language input in real world conditions, producing language for genuine meaningful communication, performing classroom tasks that prepare them for actual language use out there, meaning outside the classroom, and practicing oral communication through the give and take and spontaneity of real conversations. Writing to and for real audiences, not imaginary ones. And whole language education, one of the most attractive terms currently sweeping through our profession, whole language has been so widely interpreted that unfortunately it is on the verge of losing its impact. Initially, the term was used to emphasize one, the wholeness of language as opposed to views that fragmented language into bits and pieces of or phenomena, phon phonemes and words. Two, it was used for the interaction and interconnections between oral and written language. Or three, the importance of the written code is as natural and developmental as the spoken code. The whole language is a label that has been used to describe all of these factors, all of these approaches, cooperative learning, student-centered learning, focus on the community of learners, focus on the so social nature of language, the use of authentic natural language, meaning-centered language, and the integration of the four skills. With all these interpretations, it is hard to distinguish it from CLT in general. Its original intent, however, was to refer to the wholeness of language itself. Language is not the sum of its many dissectable and discrete parts, since part of the wholeness of language includes the four skills interrelationships. We are compelled to attend conscientiously to the integration of two or more of these skills in our classrooms. Now we move on to the next methodology or approach that is described, and that is the total physical response. Now, we looked at a little, a, a couple of minutes of this video the other day, but I'm going to play this video for you now because it's an excellent example of TPR and how total physical response actually functions in a classroom. Now we're going to do a little story, okay? Now, you do it with me, okay? You do it with me. Now, say hello to your mom. Say hello. Say hello to your mom. Hello. You are hungry. A TPR sequence is demonstrated. The children listen and do the movements accordingly. The sentences are repeated several times. In the beginning, it's important to maintain the order. The children learn to understand the meaning of the sentences with the help of mimes, gestures and drawings on the board. Doing the movements themselves is an important memory aid. 
show the palm to your mom. Your mom says, Soon, the children can make the movements on their own and in a different order. Say hello to your mom. Your mom says, Eek! Say hello to your mom. Your mom shows you some plants. Your mom says, Eek! Say hello to your mom. Hungry. Your mom shows you some plums. Cut open a plum. Show the plum to your mom. If you look at the chalkboard up behind the teacher, there's a, a bowl with plums in it, right? It's a bowl of plums that they're talking about. This plum that has been cut open has a worm coming out of it. <laughs> that That's a little worm in the plum. That's why the mother says eek all the time, because there's a worm in the plum. That's what that's all about. So I just, I had to, I had to share that thought with you because Otherwise, you're not sure why the mother is screaming eek. Yeah, exactly. There we go. Okay, you listen to the CD and you write the numbers. Here we go. Say hello to your mom. One, two. You're hungry. The children listen to the sentences from the CD. They write the numbers by the pictures in their book. Afterwards, they compare their results. And here? Six. Six. And the last number here? Who? Yes. So that's an excellent little example of how TPR actually functions. The total physical response as a methodology was developed by James Asher at San Jose State University in California. Its origins go back to the 1920s and it draws on several traditions, including developmental psychology, learning theory, and humanistic pedagogy. Like Stephen Krashen, Asher sees successful adult second language learning as running along parallel lines to that of mother tongue acquisition in children. Again, comprehension is put before production. As with the natural approach, many hours may pass before the student produces speech utterances. So you've probably noticed that if you have your own little children, or if you have younger brothers or sisters, uh, you'll probably remember from when, when they were first learning to speak, uh, oftentimes uh, a child can, can be 18 months old before they begin to actually speak and utter their own sounds. Our, our son was almost two years old before he spoke his first words and we thought there was something wrong with him. We were asking the doctor to check him out and to do tests and 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 it and the first thing he said was one day we were going through the Tim Hortons drive through and he was sitting in the back seat in his booster chair. We pulled up to the window and he leaned forward and said, two coffee double double. Oh my <laughs> we we turned around and looked at him because that was the first time he had spoken. And and he, but he had heard us order two coffee double double so often at Tim Horton's drive throughs that and he spoke it very clearly. And that's exactly what the order was that was given to us was two coffees double double. 
So, you know, we we often think that the learner of the language, just because they're quiet, we think, well, you know, maybe this isn't working, but we have to give them time to uh, assimilate the, and and take in and retain the hearing of the sounds that they hear. They have to retain them and assimilate them and process them so that they can then produce their own speech. And that takes a different amount of time for every person. You know, we, we're not all little robots. We don't all do everything in exactly the same amount of time. Some of us take a little bit longer than others to do things. And so we have to be able to be lenient and, and flexible, <coughs> excuse me, and give the, the student a little bit of time to to process out their production of the sound. In the early stages, students will act out the requests made by the teacher. Everybody raises their left arms. Maria walks slowly to the door. As students progress in understanding and confidence, more complex patterns are introduced. Sandro pass the white block to the student with a red ribbon in her hair. Elaine, take a sip of water and pass the cup to Susanna. It is claimed that TPR reduces the stress felt by second language learners and therefore induces efficient acquisition. Towards the end of a course, which can last up to 160 hours, students may be invited to verbalize their intentions. Pedro asks Carmen to open the door. Pierre, tell mommy you are sorry. So there, there's usually with TPR, there's usually an action included in the words, in the in instructions that have been given so that the student can do something and that reinforces the learning of the, the words themselves. Even though I'm skipping over these PowerPoints and these worksheets, uh, I just don't want to take the time right now to, to be looking at them, but you you should definitely do do those and uh, and have a look at them. Then we move into the immersion method, I am. Most often used with children, immersion is the way that we learned or rather acquired our first language. Immersion method requires that children spend a large portion of each day living and working in the second language. Children in bilingual families or those living abroad often experience the immersion method. In recent years, many countries, including Canada, the USA, Russia, and Wales, have carried out experiments in this area by establishing schools where all lessons are undertaken in a second language. In the case of English speaking Canadian children, French immersion program is the selected language. There has also been a growth in the number of bilingual schools where children spend half of each day working their first language and the other half in the second language. The results so far suggest quite a measure of success with this most natural approach to language learning. As the children learn by absorbing the language unconsciously in much the same way that they acquired their mother tongue, very little formal teaching is needed. Now, we're not going to watch all of these videos, but they're very good videos and you should watch these as well. Grammar translation, audiolingual, and structural approaches all emphasize accuracy. In practice, this is almost always at the expense of fluency. So is, is this the, uh, the WhatsApp group that you just set up? Did you start setting it up, Vianney? I just did, yes. Really? So are, are you Saidi, Saida? The only one that I wasn't able to add was Ada. Why? I'm not really sure why. Do you mind just writing your phone number once more time in the chat group? 
with a plus in area code and everything. Yeah, Daniel said, uh, start with plus plus. Yeah, thank you. Oh, that's very good. So that's your that's your group that's set up now. Excellent. And tell me if it's okay or I think it's just fine. Very good. I need to manage. Give me a, give me a moment. Yes, that's fine. So these previous methodologies were all emphasizing accuracy. And almost always at the expense of fluency. Once it became accepted that making a mistake is not a crime, there followed an essential shift in importance from form to meaning, that is, from grammar to morphology, the shape of the words, take, took, taken, taker, to vocabulary and semantics. So communication became more important than the perfection of the grammar. The lexical approach views meaning as stored in lexical chunks. The teacher's task is to enable learners to understand and manipulate these chunks. The grammar associated with the chosen chunks is taught, but the initial selection of items to be taught is lexically based. Much use is made of collocation. Idioms assume a more central role in the syllabus and more emphasis is placed on the receptive skills, especially listening. In common with the communicative approach, exercises should use units of discourse rather than single isolated sentences. With the humanistic approach and learner-centered teaching, these follow on from the communicative approach with its emphasis on the social and emotional rather than linguistic needs of the learners, and also from current pedagogy and mainstream teaching. Good teachers have always treated their students as individuals with their own and differing backgrounds, opinions, ambitions, and problems. They have tried to motivate their students by making these, their lessons relevant to them. In the classroom, however, this principle has always been subservient to other considerations particularly to the language being taught. The humanistic approach puts this consideration first and allows the language and the skills to be practiced to follow from it. In 1.8.3, we discuss the naming of the various approaches. It is a matter of priority, not exclusivity. In a typical activity, the teacher might ask students to bring holiday photographs to the class. Students describe their holidays and ask questions while the teacher provides corrections on their language skills. In the learner-centered approach, the curriculum is determined by discussion between teacher and learners. The syllabus evolves from students' needs. Classes could be by means of weekly meetings. <clears throat> teacher prepares the following week's lessons on the basis of Friday discussions. It works best with adult learners who have reasonably common aims with intrinsic rather than purely extrinsic motivation. For many courses throughout the world, the syllabuses are set by external guidelines, requirements, sorry, requirements. But even here, learners could decide, for example, to concentrate on reading rather than listening, or on vocabulary rather than grammar, or to have an extra pronunciation lesson. 
in, in all discussions, the teacher is consulted and students may well ad adopt the teacher's advice, but the learners make decisions to control their own learning. There should be a genuine and equal partnership between teachers and learners. Methods conclusion. Your approach to language teaching is the keystone to all your teaching methodology in the classroom. You should be able to profess at least major components of your theory of language learning and education and have at least an understanding of how that theory enlightens your classroom practice. Keep in mind the dynamic nature of the theoretical stance of even the most experienced teachers. We have much to learn collectively in the profession. You may even want to consult other approaches to second language teachings, such as community, language classes, Wikipedia, the silent way, or the natural approach, and incorporate some of their principles in your personal approach. And finally, here's a, a PDF download that you can you can have a look at. And finally, we have the outcomes based method, a curriculum planning concept. The University Grants Committee of Hong Kong recently in 2017 appointed a consultant to advise on the facilitation of outcomes based teaching and learning in Hong Kong universities. Outcome based ed education implies that when planning programs, desirable learning outcomes are identified and considered. Course content, learning activities, and assessment are designed so as to be consistent with the achievement of the des desired learning outcomes. The evidence is then gathered to determine whether the desired outcomes are being achieved. So I call this the backwards curriculum design because you start with the end and you work back through the curriculum development to get to the beginning of where you're going to start with your teaching process. This evaluation evidence provides feedback to ensure that elements in the teaching and learning environment are acting to facilitate the nurturing of the desired outcomes. In its strategic plan, the Chinese University of Hong Kong has formulated a set of desired outcomes for its graduates. So the university has expectations of what the graduates are going to be able to do at the end of their program and their, the assessment of those students along the way helps to guide that process through and, and get them through. So I'm going to let you read the rest of that on your own. And as I mentioned previously in, in, in the first couple of webinars, uh, there, there is no one methodology or one approach that works perfectly for teaching any, any language, any second language. What works the best is to take key important elements out of all these different methodologies and pull them together. And the CLT methodology is about the closest thing we've got so far to doing that because it allows you to do a bit of grammar instruction if you want to, or it allows you for, to do a bit of role play, the TPR style approach. And by doing these different styles and different approaches within the CLT framework, you're able to have a more developed, a more fully developed uh, language program for your students. So, so there we go, folks. So that's that's the end of today's today's session. Thank you so much, uh, Daniel. You're welcome. Thank you, you guys. Anybody, have, to see you. anybody have any Thank questions? You. No, really? Could you add me? I I, I didn't receive anything. I, I try Ada, but I couldn't add you on WhatsApp, and I don't know what the reason is. I was able yeah. to add everybody else, but not you. Are you are you now uh, in US? Where are you? Oh no, I'm I'm, I'm in Iran, Tehran. So, uh, but you started with plus one. So maybe that's the yeah. Problem. I have because I I I I used to live in in the US uh, a few uh, months ago. So. So I was still my phone. Maybe that's I my... have just come to. Uh, all right. Now I thought maybe that's my because I said plus then ninety eight. 
I don't know. Can you? It's good. It's good. 98 um, for Iran. Are you, in, are you yeah. in Iran? Yeah. Now I am in Toronto, but my phone number is, you know. It is Iran. Okay. It's my Iranian. So, but Ariane cannot add me, so I don't know what the problem is. Can oh, anyone yes. else add Ada? Yes, let me just see. Group? Let me see. Yeah. Um, I do. Yeah, I second. do have. I have oh, an appointment, I so I have to leave. But thank you all very much. Thank you for adding me to the WhatsApp, and we'll be in touch. Thank you so much. Thank you, Daniel. Thank for you, the Linda. Very good, Linda. Bye bye. See you okay, next bye. time. Thank you. Okay. Bye now. Well, um, I, I, you know, I don't have access to. Okay, to the um, the participants to add. So I, I maybe I'm not. I wish I'd given uh, access to just add um, Ida. Maybe and you are the admin, so no one else can add. Yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. Nay, you're the admin, so you're the only <laughs> one who can add. <laughs> okay, I'll figure maybe it out. You can let other people. You should be, be able. Admin. You should be able to add her. That there should there should be a problem. It doesn't appear in my cell phone at all. Okay, if you can give if you can give me access, then I can add her. Yep, I'll try to figure it out. Thank and you. give me just a few more minutes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Daniel, for your thank great you, Daniel. Um, bye -bye. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. You're welcome, ladies. Thank you, ladies. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Good to bye, -bye. see you. I do. Yeah. Good luck on the exam, and I'll see you next Monday. Yeah. Okay, thank you. See you next thank Monday. You. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.